here I am once again recording in my car anyway what's up guys this is North Sea Hero and I wanted to record a little video here on a couple of different subjects uh, one there was a video I recorded a while back let's just jump right into this let's just jump straight in let's just jump smack into it a while back I recorded a video <clears throat> titled Unjustifiable, The Negligence That Killed Duante Wright, or I guess Dante Wright is how I'm hearing a lot of people pronounce his name. I've heard it both ways, you know. It's spelled D-U-A-N-T-E, that looks to me like Duante, like a combination of Dwayne and Dante. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I've heard it both ways, so... In any case, a while back I recorded that video, and Insane Asylum Cherry Paul had recorded a video beforehand about it. Now I recorded my video, which was kind of partly in response to his, partly, mostly just my own video on it. Well, what ends up happening is, I end up actually editing together the video, and then I keep meaning to, like, because it's such a big video... Um, and would take so long to upload from my phone, what I had been planning on doing was I was, I kept meaning to just click the upload button on Wi-Fi before I go to sleep. Uh, it's been over a week, like a week and a half, and I still haven't done that. So I decided I'd just scrap the whole thing. I'm just going to talk about it now. Better late than never, I suppose. But by then, a lot of things have changed. A lot of new information's come out, so that's why I wanted to talk about it again instead of just uploading the old video. Part one. <clears throat> Apparently, some new information has come out that the warrant for Duante Wright that the police were serving at the time may have been for aggravated or armed robbery rather than simple weapons possession. If that is the case, that does change the story as to whether Duante Wright should have had any warrants at all. Because what it said in my original video was that Duante Wright should have never had a weapons possession charge because a weapons possession charge should not be allowed to exist in the United States of America because of the Constitution. Um, in the original video, Unjustifiable, I had said basically that my view is that everybody who's not actively in prison or in a mental institution uh, should be able to have guns. And then in the video that was scrapped, I was going to update that, so let's go ahead and take care of that here. To put it simply and concisely, if you are not actively imprisoned and you are deemed to be capable of entering into contracts on your own, in other words, if you have your own power of attorney, it is my belief you should have the legal ability to keep and bear arms, to purchase and possess firearms. Period. Period. Uh, as of right now, law in the United States and in most states is that if you're a felon, if you are someone who has ever been convicted of a felony, uh, or for misdemeanor domestic battery, you cannot purchase her own weapons. Um, I'm not on board with that. Uh, and, and here's why. So basically, to, to, to start with the felony thing. Um, if a person gets convicted of a felony, let's say it's murder, let's say it's rape, let's say it's aggravated robbery or armed robbery, whatever the case may be. Let's say a person gets convicted of a felony and they get, I don't know, 20 years in prison. <clears throat> and they serve out the 20 years. They serve the whole thing, the full 20 years, the whole shebang. At the end of those 20 years, they're given a set of clothing, sent on their way. Just leave the prison, you know, walk to the nearest bus stop and go home. 
depending on the person's family situation, what kind of family or contacts they may or may not have, they may not have a home at that point. I mean, there's things like halfway houses and stuff, but point being, a person's been convicted of a felony, murder, rape, armed robbery, whatever. <clears throat> they go to prison for 20 years. They spend 365 days a year for 20 straight years, 365 by 20. Seven thousand three hundred days. Does that sound right? Seven thousand three hundred, because three hundred sixty-five times two would be seven hundred twenty plus ten, so seven thirty times ten. Yeah, seven thousand three hundred days. Seven thousand three hundred times in a row, they spend twenty-three hours in a locked cell with one hour of sunlight and fresh air per day. You take someone out of the sunshine and fresh air, lock them in a cell for 23 hours straight, and you repeat this process 7,300 times. Uh, the way I see it, their debt to society is paid. Now, you could argue they shouldn't, they still shouldn't be allowed to do this or that. Once you've committed certain crimes, you know, you're marked for life as whatever, but if that's the case, why even bother locking them up for 20 years? If it's not supposed to rehabilitate them, if it's not supposed to turn them from the person they were into a new person, what's even the point? Why not just kill them? Why not just execute them? Because the thing you have to understand is that if you're passing judgment on someone that they cannot own firearms for their personal protection, you're effectively executing them. In my view. In my mind. Um... Or you're at least putting them in effectively like a gladiatorial arena where they are expected at any point they could die. <clears throat> now I know, I know, real life is not that dangerous, <clears throat> even here in America, despite what the, the Euro pores will tell you. Your chances of needing a self-defense weapon are fairly low, fortunately. Uh, most, self most lawful gun owners who carry a handgun in self-defense are, fortunately for them and for everyone else, going to go their whole lives without ever needing it. I want to be that guy. I want to be that guy who carries a pistol with him his whole life, or for as long as he has his, a sound mind and body in his life, and never once takes it out and points it at another person. I want to be that guy. But there's no guarantee. If there was a guarantee that I'd never need it, I wouldn't bother carrying it, honestly. Because uh, at that point it just becomes a bother. So if you're gonna so if you're gonna pass judgment on someone that they can't own firearms, why not just execute them? Oh well, we can't trust this person to own guns because they're they're a murderer, they're a rapist. Okay, why did you lock them up for twenty years and then let them go? Why not just execute them or give them life in prison? If you're gonna tell someone they can't defend themselves, put them in that steel cage where they're protected from the outside world for the rest of their life. Pick one or the other is basically what I'm saying. Uh, in, I'm just using this as an example. But if, if society deems that he's going to be locked in a cell that long, so be it. But if society also deems that 20 years of being locked in a cell is enough to, is enough, if society determines that that's enough, so be it. He goes back into society. He becomes a member of the people and his right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Either that or you execute him or you lock him up for life. The Constitution of the State of Indiana states that the purpose of imprisonment shall be rehabilitative 
and not punitive. Now, if anybody can tell you that that is not what's happening, it would be Paul over at Insane Asylum, Jerry Paul. Um, but that is the intended purpose. That's the stated purpose. Now, the reason I go into all this is because one of the things that I wanted to clarify is, yes, people who are considered to have mental disabilities to the point that they lack their own agency, that we can say is... They're, they're, they're not part of the people who have the right to keep and bear arms. Now, it, it's a bit of a complicated situation, a bit of a complicated subject when you think about it, because ultimately, the Founding Fathers, right, extremely smart guys, very, very intelligent, tons of foresight, um, but they weren't, they still weren't perfect, right? Very intelligent, but not omniscient. They had foresight, and more of it than probably almost anyone in the entire history of the world, but they were not oracles. They did not have actual uh, prophetic powers. They couldn't see the future. They could just make very good, edu well-educated guesses as to what the future would hold. Lots of foresight, no prophecy. Lots of intelligence, no omniscience. So I imagine when the Founding Fathers wrote, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, individuals with such a level of mental disability that they could not participate in society unassisted honestly were probably just not considered people. They weren't considered part of the people. Now keep in mind, the majority of the founding fathers, particularly those from the North, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, etc., etc., were actually against slavery. I know Thomas Jefferson owned slaves, but they were against slavery. Thomas Jefferson wanted to uh, put slavery as one of the awful things that made King George such a bad guy that they were going to split off from his country, but then Southerners, uh, delegates from the South, got that stricken out. Watch the movie 1776 if you want the quick and catchy version, or, you know, do some historical research. Your choice. Or do neither. That's also your choice. But don't step to me if you're not going to do at least one of the two. So. Um... Yeah, so I guess the Founding Fathers were like, well, people who are violent criminals are already in prison. People who are who have mental challenges to the point that they can't participate in society unassisted uh, are already in asylums. Um, actual asylums back then, not insane asylum, Cherry Paul. Uh, so yeah, so we don't, we don't need to put any exceptions in here, right? Because here's the thing. The... The Founding Fathers didn't bother writing exceptions to the rights that were guaranteed by the Bill of Rights, for the most part. Because they knew that people were going to be smart enough and sensible enough to understand what the exceptions were in the first place. The whole point of the Bill of Rights was it was a... It was sort of like a, a Ten Commandments for the government. It was, thou shalt not X. Thou shalt not... Uh, impede the right of the of the press or of the people to peacefully assemble or or establish a religion of the United States or prevent the free exercise of religion thou shalt not infringe upon the right of the people to keep and bear arms thou shalt not uh, quarter soldiers in a person's home during times of peace that was sort of one of the exceptions they did put in that you could quarter soldiers in people's homes in times of war understandable um, thou shalt not search and seize people or their property without due process. Uh, you know, the list goes on and on, but it was essentially like the Ten Commandments for the government. It was, thou shalt not X. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The Founding Fathers knew that we were going to get advanced, more advanced weaponry one day. They knew that we were going to get something really advanced. They may not have known that it was going to be an AR-15 or uh, an M16. They may not have known there was going to be an M16 capable of fully automatic fire of 556 five, NATO ammunition from a standard capacity 30 round magazine providing about four point something seconds of a continuous stream of, of, of fire in a reliable method. But they knew we were going to have advanced weaponry on, on that level in the future. And yet they didn't write any exceptions in it because they, they intended for us to have those things, guys. They really did. Um, they didn't bother writing an exception for violent felons, etc., because they said the people. And so a person who was who was uh, 
uh, uh, successfully convicted of such an infamous crime, in other words, in modern terminology, a felony, that you could even think about taking away their guns, like, reasonably, they're already going to be in prison. They're already going to be imprisoned for their crimes. And if they have a finite imprisonment, they survive to the end of it, and they get out, the Founding Fathers probably would have said, oh, well, you know, they did it, they paid their debt to society, they went to prison for the infamous crime, give them their guns back. Seriously, guns effing rock, don't ban them. George Washington. Closer to the truth than you realize. Read the Federalist, Federalist Papers. Um... So yeah, um, that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about regarding firearms. Now, regarding following up on the situation of Duante Wright. Okay, yes, you could say the that he had a warrant out for robbery or something like that. Sure. Um, sure, maybe he was resisting arrest. Okay, sure. Um, those are all situations where then it becomes a completely different ballpark than just, oh, cop did bad, right? Because, sure, if somebody's resisting arrest violently and, and they're presenting a danger to the cop, or the cop reasonably believes that they uh, that a danger to their life and limb is present from this person, uh, then they use lethal force. And, you know, reasonably believe kind of has an entirely different standard. The thing you, the thing you guys got to understand if you're going to talk about these things is that reasonable belief in a high stress situation, let alone a life threatening stress situation, very different from when you're just sitting down talking about it in hindsight or in hypotheticals, or even sitting down and talking about it in a courtroom. The, the concept of reasonably believe completely changes when you've got a 10th of a second to make a decision and the wrong decision could potentially cost you or someone else their life. Since the last video I made on this subject, uh, there was the incident with Makia Bryant. Um, completely justified shooting, 100%. 100% justified. Uh, the cop who did it, national hero. Uh, national hero. And if you believe that Black Lives Matter, if you actually believe that, if you say the phrase Black Lives Matter, and you agree with that, which I do, I agree that Black Lives Matter. Um, the statement, the concept, okay? Um, Self-described Marxist organizations that use those words in some order, in some combination, as their moniker, not so much. But the statement that Black Lives Matter, I believe this. And if you believe this as well, you have to believe that the police officer who shot Makia Bryant is a national hero to everyone of every race, and that what he did was not only justified, it was completely the right thing to do, it was completely good, it was completely just, it was justice, it was good. You have to believe that if you believe that black lives matter, because he saved a young black girl's life. Period. End of story. End of story. Now, we can go on with the story if you want, but for all practical purposes, that really is the end of the story. Because, okay, sure, he shot a black girl. But he saved another one's life. And you have all kinds of... You, you have people, high-profile Democrat individuals and politicians come out and saying, defending child knife fights. Not joking. Look this stuff up. Seriously. Defending child knife fights is something that teenagers have supposedly done for a long time, for eons, according to one tweet. You know, I still have some hope. I still have some hope for the people of this world and for the future. And the reason is because when I look at videos or tweets about these things, whether it's the tweets themselves or videos themselves that are defending child knife fights defending the stabbing of black teenagers, unironically, um, or videos or tweets talking about these things and making fun of them, I just see comment after comment after comment completely clowning on the idea, okay? See, this is what, this is what the 
like Black Lives Matter movement, which is entirely anti-black lives and is entirely anti-America in general, um, believes. And this is what, you know, the establishment believes. Uh, or, or not what they believe, but what they say. They'll, they'll push this idea that, oh, kids just, you know, having knife fights is fine. Even if one of them doesn't even have a knife and it's actually just a knife assault. Because uh, you can't really call it a knife fight if only one of them has a knife. Whatever. Um, I see so many comments clowning on that idea. Comments like, oh yeah, I miss the days when I was in high school and me and the boys used to get together and knife fight each other. Like, just things like that. Things like that give me hope for the future. That enough people, enough people are still awake. Enough people still have some level of self-awareness to recognize the insanity of defending child knife fights and are willing to clown on it. That enough people are clowning on that 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 is what keeps me going it it, it keeps me going guys it really does so you can talk about oh makia was the one that that called the police in the first place uh okay why did you call the police and then try to stab a girl in front of them when they showed up because it wasn't like the officer just rolled up on the scene, saw the the stabbing about to happen, and shot, and then found out, and then started asking questions later. Like they were there, and then she pulled out a knife and went to stab her. You could say, "Oh, she, she, the other girl was assaulting her first. Okay, when you've got someone backed up against a car and you've got a knife out, you don't stab them in defense anymore. That's not defense anymore. You can hold the knife out, back away, or even just hold them and keep the knife back. That's one thing. But when you're going to stab someone, just watch the video, guys. But when it comes to Duante Wright, um, yeah, you know, we can have a discussion about it now that more facts are coming out. Uh, you can, you know, his warrant was for robbery, not just weapon possession. Okay, sure. Uh, there still should be no weapon possession charges on the warrant if that was a thing. There shouldn't be just possession of a weapon. Now, usage of a weapon in a crime, okay, ha- uh, like a weapon making a robbery worse, sure. Sure. Absolutely. 100%. I'm, I support that. Not only am I okay, not only can I tolerate that, I support that. Um, you could say, oh, well, he was resisting arrest, trying to drive away. Okay. You could say, oh, it looked like he was lunging for a weapon. Okay. And and these are all things, these are all very fair points to make, you know. I'm not saying that Duante Wright was a completely innocent soul uh, who did nothing wrong and just got executed by the police for it. I'm not saying he is, I'm not saying he isn't. It was never my intention to say that one way or the other. Uh, The purpose of my original video was mainly just to talk about the concept of firearm responsibility and that at the end of the day, if, at the end of the day, you're responsible for what comes out of the barrel of your gun, period. You're responsible for what comes out of the barrel of your gun. And if you shoot someone with a gun and kill them, and you didn't even intend to be using your gun, that is your fault. Someone died unjustifiably under because of you. Period. End of story. Bye bye. See you later. Uh, I see a lot of people talking about, you know, there's this video uh, on YouTube Shorts, aka TikTok 2, Google Boogaloo, that there's this guy talking about, oh, for all the people saying it was a mistake, here, here's my uh, department issued taser, uh, is very different from a Glock 19. Okay. You are not in a five second or quarter second split decision. You think you're about to die, do something situation. It's very easy for you to say these things when you are not, when you, when you are not, and have no reason to believe that you are half a second away from potentially dying. That being said, the officer needed to have more training. She needed to do that training of her own accord if the department was not providing her enough training. She could have done snap cap drills. She could have done, you know, holster draw drills with the gun and the taser to train her muscles on the difference between the two. You don't have to hit up the range and spend, you know, $12 on a box of ammo or $35 on a box of ammo at the time of this recording. 
you don't need to spend that money to train necessarily, okay? You can load up some snap caps, do some holster draw drills, have your taser in a different spot, do taser holster draw drills. You can do these things on your own time to make sure that you don't end up as the next whatever this officer's name was. I can't even remember her name, to be honest, off the top of my head. But you can do these things. And you should do these things because if you're going to if you're going to carry a gun, you have to be doing these things. You have to load up the snap caps. You have to do your holster draw drills. You have to do. You have to take it to the range and you have to fire actual rounds to train. You have to fire your self defense ammo to train. You have to fire full metal jacket range ammo a lot more to train. But you also have to load up the snap caps and do the holster draw training, the malfunction training. You have to do these things. You have to do these things, guys. If you're going to carry a gun, like I do, you have to do these things, like I do. Now, I am not, you know, certified at uh, uh, Baldy McSpecial Forces School of um, of Advanced Combat Pistol Combat, but I practice. Okay, I practice. Calling it training is even a bit of a stretch. I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to even call it training, honestly. But I practice. I practice under the watch of instructors who aren't on the clock instructing me specifically, but will help me out, you know, some, some cool dudes from where I work. I practice. I practice under good watch. I practice well. I practice with the live ammo. I practice with the dummy rounds. I do these things. I carry a gun. If you're going to carry a gun like me, you have to at least practice like me. Because honestly, I'm not trying to brag here. I'm not trying to brag here and say I'm some super great gun owner who's putting in all this work. No, quite very far from it. Let me make it clear. What I'm doing is the minimum. I'm doing the minimum, okay? I'm not saying that I'm doing some, you know, super great, awesome training. I'm saying I'm doing the minimum. So if you're carrying a gun like me and you're doing less than me, you're doing something wrong. Because I'm already doing the minimum, okay? I'm not trying to brag here. If anything, I'm putting myself down over here. I'm doing the minimum, but at least I'm doing the minimum. Point is, you have to train. And if you're going to sign up for a job in which the lives of the people are in your hands, and you're carrying both a gun and a taser, you have to train so that in that high-stress situation, your muscles can do the thinking for you and they can do them correctly so that you don't draw your gun and say taser, 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 and then fire a live round. Again, on the one hand, I want to look at this from both sides, man. But on the one hand, it's very easy for Officer Cop to record a, a TikTok video about uh, all the differences between his issued taser and his, and his firearm and how you can never mess the two up between the two, and it's very easy for him to talk about that in the comfort in his room when he has no reason to believe he's half a second away from losing his life. On the other hand, if you're going to sign up to protect the people carrying a gun and a taser, it's not enough to know the difference. It's not enough to be like Copy McCopperson and be able to go through the list of differences in your room. You have to train your muscles so that when your muscles have to do the thinking for you in that fight or flight situation, your muscles know what to do. They've, they've graduated the school of taser, they've graduated the school of, of gun, and they've graduated the school of knowing the difference between taser and gun. Because it's not up to your brain whether... It's not up to your brain whether you know the difference or not. The, the, the part of Copy McCopperson's brain that he was using... To, 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 to describe the differences between the taser and the gun, that part of the brain is already ch long checked out. By the time that half second is over in that fight or flight situation, that part of the brain's already checked out and gone to lunch. So your muscles are doing the thinking for you. But if you're going to sign up for a job where your muscles are doing the thinking for you and the lives of the people are in your hands, you have to teach your muscles so they'll know the difference. So yes, the shooting of Duante Wright was unjustified. Even if he had a warrant out for robbery, even if he was resisting arrest, even if it looked like he was lunging for a weapon, even if it looked like he was trying to drive away, it was still unjustified. It was unjustified because the cop tried to use less than lethal force, 
but use lethal force. And look, I know I sound like a prosecutor right now, like, oh, well, you know, he didn't really believe his life was in danger because if he did, he would have done this, that, and the third thing. But listen, ultimately, at the very least, it was a failing. It was a failing on the part of the officer, whether through malice, whether through negligence. Either way, a man lost his life when he didn't need to. Sure, maybe he was resisting arrest, and if he hadn't resisted arrest and had just complied with the officers like you're supposed to, he'd still be alive. We can, we can have that discussion and we can put that onus on him seven days a week, twice on Sundays. But if you're going to sign up for a job where the life of the people is in your hands, and it's going to be in your hands in a situation where your muscles have to do the thinking, you have to teach your muscles. You have to train them. Look, I'm all for more police funding when it comes to training, honestly. I'm all for police uh, having that, um, was it, uh, uh, cool, cool fire, cool fire device installed on their weapons so they can do that recoil training, uh, in, you know, simulation. I'm all for police having simulation rounds and doing, you know, live fire with simulation round exercises where they've got body armor and they've got those special rounds where it's effectively a real firearm with real ammunition except that the projectile is like a little like paint splatter projectile and it's effectively like a, a hybrid between paintball and real guns I'm all for police doing that and for footing the bill for the police to do that if it means that stuff like this is going to be less likely to happen but if you're going to sign up for that job and you know the department's not giving you the kind of training you need to do to to, to train your muscles to differentiate between the two, you got to do it yourself or, or retire. You have to. Because at the end of the day, you signed up for that job knowing that the lives of the people were going to be in your hands. Take it seriously, guys. Take that seriously. I know it's easy for me to say, being that I've never been a, a police officer, but, you know, at the same time, I'm just trying to be fair. Okay, I'm trying to be fair to everybody. I'm trying to indict everyone that I think needs indictment. I'm trying to um, defend everyone I think that needs defending. I'm not trying to play sides here, one side or the other. You know, I'm not a cab. I'm not thin blue line. I'm neither of those things. I'm not on either side's team because I don't play games. So, when I was texting Paul about these videos, about the response I was going to uh, record, um, he said that he was also going to do a video about it, um, and that he thought I might be surprised, um, be, uh, given his more, you know, his left of center leanings uh, on his views on gun rights. Eh, not really. A lot of left wing people really love gun rights. That's why gun. That's why gun control is really usually a losing issue for Democrats, and why they need to, and why they need mass shootings, um, in order to even try to begin to push it. Now, I'm not saying any conspiracy theories about orchestrated mass shootings or anything. Let me make that clear. I'm just saying, on a normal day of the week, it's a losing issue for him, for a reason. But you know, I'm wondering if maybe Paul, upon seeing this video, if I ever actually get around to cutting and uploading this one this time, if he might be surprised at the amount of police accountability, uh, the amount of accountability I want to see from police officers and the amount of reform uh, that I want to see them go through because, um, you know, I'm right of center. I'm like the conservative foil to Paul in a sense and vice versa. Um, I, did, I know I didn't really go too deep in this video uh, in terms of the overall kinds of police reform that I'd like to see, but doing so would take a whole other uh, 40 minutes and 52 seconds. Well, I'm going to have some editing to do on this one. In any case, with all that having been said, remember to rate the video, leave a comment down below, but the number one thing you can do to help me grow the channel even more than subscribing and ringing that bell share the video share it in any form remix it make you know do whatever you want with it it's going to be creative commons just make sure that you share it and that one way or another the people that you share it with whether it be your friends family or your channel's community get a link back here that is the number one thing you can do if you want to help a guy out over here and uh in any case 
This is North Sea Hero, signing out.